All right. So thank you for joining us, everybody. This is uh, the Angari Video Confidence Podcast. My name is John Mahan. Um, and this is actually an interview I'm very excited to bring you guys. I've been thinking about this for a while and couldn't quite find the right guest um, until you know, I recently realized um, who that guest would be. So there's been two very related topics that have come up that have been barriers for people as I've been doing these interviews. Um, and one of the things that's been a real barrier for people is, believe it or not, we all play a role in everyone else's life. Now, you know, for our children and for our spouse, we play a major role. And in most people's lives, we're nothing but an extra. But there's a role we play. And there's a role we're expected to play. And people's view of us tends to not really be all that flexible for us to act significantly outside of that role. In fact, sometimes when we start acting significantly outside of that role the world has for us, we get some pushback on it. Um, I remember a, a woman I, I once worked with, you know, she was in her 40s in a, some kind of like a finance or accounting type of job. And that was her role and everyone expected her to behave accordingly. But she started doing video content about mindset and about self-development and started creating a personal brand for herself on LinkedIn and even started a life coaching business. And she got a lot of pushback from her colleagues, coworkers, even, you know, family members at points saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are, this isn't you, right? Because again, people had this narrowly defined role they wanted her to live within, this lane they wanted her to stay in. And, and when she started acting outside of that, she got a little pushback. Similarly, there was an agent I worked with uh, in uh, Florida. She was a real estate agent and she had recently relocated to her city. So she was kind of new to the area. And this was like back in the days before, you know, Facebook Live was really a thing. It had just been released. Nobody was using it. Definitely nobody was using it for business. And she started doing Facebook Live, like tours of her city to kind of promote and grow her business in the area. And she got a lot of pushback from her peers, from her mentors saying, what are you, what are you doing? You're a new agent. You should be, you know, doing cold calls and door knocking and do everything else that all the other, you know, agents who are new to the area are doing. And again, their view of her was not flexible enough to, you know, allow her to, to start acting in these novel new ways. So, you know, uh, the, the way I would word that is that for a lot of people, it, it's difficult for them to step up and start living the life they want to live rather than just living the life that people expect them to live and want them to live. Similarly, a second thing has come up, which is very closely related, and that's when your view of yourself is not flexible enough to allow you to behave in, in new and novel ways, right? When you understand internally what your role is and feel like acting outside of that just, just isn't right and it causes a lot of fear and anxiety in you when you think about doing that. I most commonly hear this expressed as, well, I can't do blank because I'm not blank, right? So, you know, someone will say, I, I can't start a YouTube channel. I'm not young and tax savvy. I'm a woman in my 50s. Or someone will say, you know, I'll, I can't write a book. I'm not a good writer. Or I can't start a business. I don't have enough, you know, connections and, you know, savings built up to do that. But it, again, it comes in when, you, when your view of yourself isn't flexible enough to allow you to do big, bold, audacious new things that scare you. So those are two things that have come up quite a bit in the interviews I've done. And I haven't really been able to speak to them. I've noticed them, but I haven't really been able to speak to them. And we really haven't covered it. Um, but the woman I brought on today as a guest, uh, Dame Sterling, has gone through this in spades. Like she has gone through so much of this that most of us will never, ever experience. Um, and for her, it was mostly because when she was born, due to her anatomy, she was assigned the gender male, which, as you can imagine, caused a lot of confusion for a lot of people for a lot of time and only in the you know, recent years has it kind of been sorted out um, and figured out but as you can imagine through this journey dame has had to dramatically change her view of herself and the rest of the world has had to dramatically change their view of her as well so in this interview we're going to be talking about you know how to get internal clarity right when you're feeling called to something how to get clarity that it is the right thing and, and what the right timing is we're going to talk about once you've got that clarity, how do you muster the courage to act when it, you know, taking action absolutely terrifies you. We'll talk about once you've started acting, how do you handle people's reactions to the changes in your life, particularly, you know, the negative reactions that you'll get. And then we'll kind of wrap up talking about what the benefits of living in alignment with who you really are, right? What those benefits are and what those benefits she's seen. So um, thank you so much, Dame, for joining us for this conversation. Since we have a lot of questions to cover, I'm just going to go ahead and kind of jump right in. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. So one of the first questions here, 
when it comes to getting that internal clarity, right, when you're starting to feel called to something, uh, you know, of course, in your case, that was a very dramatic uh, shift, you know, but for some people, they might feel themselves called to, you know, quit their job and go into ministry or quit their job and start a business, or maybe they're called to start a podcast or write a book. But when you're starting to feel something, um, but you aren't quite sure, is this something I should act on? Is this, is this something that's, you know, worth taking that, that, that motion? Do you think that's something a person can just sit on and internally think about, meditate on, pray on, whatever their style is, and, you know, come to a solution? Or do you think it's the type of thing where you need to take some action to test things out? A helpful analogy here, I don't know if it'll help other people, but it helps me think about it. Imagine you're in your house and you smell a smell and you're trying to figure out where it's coming from. You can't really just stand in place and think real hard and figure out where the smell's coming from. You have to start moving in one direction, then the other, then the other, kind of testing hypotheses, figuring out when the smell gets stronger, when the smell gets weaker. So in your experience, when it comes to big changes in your identity, can you just introspect your way through it? Or does it take some testing, some hypothesizing to get feedback to figure out whether or not what you're feeling is, you know, what, what it is and, and, and what extent you should act on it? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, um, in my case, I think uh, it definitely proved that um, once I started acting on it, I learned a lot more about myself than I knew originally just, um, you know, through introspection. Um, you know, I, I could only get so far with the introspection before I could actually experience how it was to move in the world as a woman and be treated as a woman in the world. Um, and it wasn't until I was treated that way that I started to really come to fully understand my identity. Because before then, before you're having anyone to interact with or to, you know, feed off of, or before any of that is out in the open, it's all just hypothetical. So to clarify then, uh, I guess your advice to someone who, again, is feeling called to something, feeling pulled to something, um, don't wait around for like absolute crystal clear certainty about exactly what you should do and how and what take a few early steps and kind of use the feedback from that to, to chart your course. Definitely. Um, there are always going to be aspects of your either identity or, or any kind of a deep personal choice that you won't fully know until you've started living it. Cool. Um, now next question here you've gotten a decent amount of clarity, right? Through introspection, through yes. early action, and you feel like, all right, yes, what I'm feeling is real, and this is the direction I want to take. Um, the moment you realize that, do you just start jumping in and acting right away? Um, or is there a, maybe some delay involved? Um, and do you, you know, make these changes visible to the whole world at once, or do you kind of stagger it out? Um, I guess, what was it like for you, and, and do you have any advice that you suggest other, uh, suggest other people follow or maybe don't follow? Sure. Um, I, in my case, I jumped right in. Um, I started acting as soon as I realized what was going on and what, um, what needed to happen. I, I immediately started making decisions and, and changing some of the way I lived, but it was still very slow. Um, there were certain milestones or certain, you know, acts or accomplishments that I would go for for a little while, like just wearing more feminine clothing. And then after some time, I started shaving more. And, you know, a little later than that, I started to, um, you know, ask people to use a different name for me and all sorts of, you know, little steps along the way. Um, for me, I was not able to come out all at once to everyone. Um, there was my, my work and um, there was my ex-wife's family so um they were not very friendly <laughs> to uh trans people or queer people in general really and so that was really the longest um that i stayed in the closet was to her family um <clears throat> it was well over a year after i had come out at work that um i started to come out to her family so a bit of a staggered, staggered rollout. Um, you know, obviously it is orders of magnitude different, but um, when I was, you know, going through the process of deciding, am I going to start this podcast? And, you know, I went through some of the same stuff, right? Of saying, I'm not a podcast host. I'm a regular software guy, mm -hmm. right? And I was afraid what people would say, right? And be like, 
know, John, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to be a big shot or something? Uh, stop trying to be something you're not. So I, I know I rolled it out kind of in a staggered approach, right? You know, first telling a few close friends, then a few uh, loose acquaintances, and then eventually, you know, making my public announcements. Um, so, yeah. I think, I think that's probably a pattern for a lot of people. You know, that's okay to stagger things out as long as you do something, right? As long as you do something. Yeah. All right, so, so now you got clarity, right, in your head. Now it's time to start, you know, taking actions. Um, I'm curious for you, did you find ways to work through some of your fears and silence your fears and then act? Or did you just end up making action, you know, taking action despite the fact that your fears were as strong and as loud as they ever were? Oh, absolutely. Um, I started acting right away and I was terrified at first. Um, the first couple of times I went out in public dressed in women's clothing, I remember, um, you know, I remember driving somewhere, parking the car and then sitting in the car frozen with my hand on the handle, like ready to open the door, but not opening it and just frozen with fear because as soon as I was out of that door, like, there was no going back. Um, yeah, it, it was terrifying. And the number of times when I'd be leaving the house, I would get to the front door and I would stop with my hand on the handle and I couldn't open it. And I'd have to just steal myself and get that resolve to just open the door and go outside. So a lot of people, you know, talk about, you know, fear that almost paralyzes them and it feels like it almost takes away their ability to act. Um, you know, such as what you're describing there, but, you know, you repeatedly found ways to work through it. Any particular advice of how to almost force yourself to act, even when the fear feels paralyzing? I think for me, what helped the most was to know that since I had made this choice, it was now, I don't want to say an inevitability, but once I made that choice, I knew there was no going back. So I may as well push through sort of like being on a rickety bridge and you're halfway across and you know that it's you're just as close to the other side so you may as well just get across you know instead of turning around and going back so yeah for me that was it, it was i just kept thinking about that all the time like this is what i've decided to do and it's going to happen and there's nothing i can do to stop it so i may as well go full steam ahead yeah interesting all right um for you, does it feel like you were running towards something or running away from something? Um, I think in my case, that's a bit of a complicated question to ask um, yeah. or, or to answer rather, um, because it's definitely a bit of both. Um, I mean, mostly it was something I'm running towards. Um, realizing who I was and starting to live that way and experience life in the way that I was meant to, um, it, it was absolutely life-changing. And while there's a lot of emphasis placed on um, gender dysphoria for trans people and of you know the discomfort that we feel at being referred to by our assigned gender at birth, there is also another aspect to that that's not as often discussed outside of the trans community, which is gender euphoria, which is the the joy that you feel from being correctly identified and correctly treated as the gender that you are. Um, and I don't think that, I don't think there's really any other experience to, to compare that to. It's something completely unique. It's like one of the most wonderful and amazing feelings that you can experience. And it's so life affirming. And so there was definitely something I was running towards in that regard always. Um, I just wanted more of that. I, every time I felt that little bit of euphoria, I just, I wanted the next bit. I wanted the next high, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, that's definitely one aspect of it for me. The other would be that at the time I came out, I was married to a, um, a straight woman and I knew I knew that coming out was going to cause problems and I knew that that was likely to end our relationship. Um, it did eventually, um, you know, for many reasons, but the transition being chief among them, you know, we decided that we were better off being separate. Um, so there was an interesting feeling while I was transitioning that while I was running towards something that made me so happy, 
I was also moving myself further away from someone who had made me happy for so many years of my life. Um, which was both very sad, but also it freed me to be who I am. Because while I was with Megan, I couldn't be not just a woman, but I couldn't be any of the other things that I was able to discover in myself once I knew that I was a woman. Interesting. So here's one thing I'm wondering, though. The, the human mind is wonderful at creating disaster scenarios <clears throat> in exquisite detail, right? Taking fears and painting them out in, in, in your mind. But I've always found the human brain isn't nearly as good at understanding what the benefit of an action will be, partially just because we're more wired for defensive, you know, fear than we are for, you know, aggressive chasing of gain. Um, but also just because a lot of times we haven't experienced what the other side of the rainbow looks like, so it's impossible for us to imagine it. Whereas, you know, we have experienced right. different versions of pain. So for you, did you find that the visions of your fear and the downside of the transition were more easily visible than, you know, the potential benefits of the transition? And if so, you know, how did you motivate yourself to chase a, a, a vision of the future that you didn't even know what it would look like or had never experienced? Definitely, yes. Um, I could easily imagine every possible bad scenario that could happen. And I still can. I mean, it's, it's not something that necessarily leaves, but it's, it's so much less uh, present now. The fears, they were, while very, very strongly grounded, um, you know, they, they don't control me. They don't, um, they don't decide who I am or who I'm going to be. And while that fear was very controlling in the beginning, like I said, you know, there were times when I couldn't even open the door. I mean, now I, I don't even think twice about walking down the street. I don't think twice about anything that I do, um, you know, and the, the joy and the just the, the opportunities that you get from living as yourself and the, the joy that it brings you and the fulfillment is so much more worth it than any of the things that you're afraid about. Um, any of the things that you could lose from transition or from any other major choice like that, it's hard to say this exactly because there are people who lose their jobs or lose their home or lose you know something that is very necessary to them. Um, but really, all those things can be gotten again you can find those things again you can you know gain them back there's nothing that you can really lose permanently other than relationships and honestly the ones that you lose from being yourself are ones that weren't worth it in the first place awesome thanks for sharing that um so now i think well, you know, transition a little bit from the initial stages of action to, you know, once you've started to act, right? Once you've started to live in alignment with who you are and act in alignment with the life you want to live, you're going to get some pushback. Um, for you, did other people's pushback or other people's doubt ever make you doubt yourself? Um, it never made me doubt myself, but it did make me, um, it did make me realize just how many obstacles I was going to have to overcome. Um, I'm not sure how much this translates to other scenarios because when you're you know thinking about your own gender or something as as intimate as that there's definitely a, a clarity that comes with that that i don't think you would get from some other you know life experiences but sure. at the same time um yes i think when you encounter those things in other people where they're pushing back against you anyone can experience those moments of doubt those moments of you know, questioning themselves and their own, um, their own judgment, their own resolve. Um, I know plenty of, you know, trans people who have been uh, told by many people around them, like loved ones and friends and family that like, they're not doing the right thing, that there's, you know, that, uh, that this is, you know, a silly idea or whatever. And they minimize the person's feelings to a point where, yeah, sometimes you can start to question whether it's a good idea or not. I don't really often know of people who uh, feel differently about their own convictions, but you can definitely feel, um, feel very different about how you are, uh, how you're acting in the world and how 
you know, what, whether or not what you're doing is a good idea. Yeah. And of course, from my own experience, I can say that it didn't have that sort of effect on me. Um, it didn't make me question. In fact, if anything, people having doubts about me only made my resolve stronger. <laughs> Interesting. For you, um, which I will say level of connection caused you the most the most difficulty was it like the strangers you were worried about was it your close friends and family you were worried about was it like you know work acquaintances that you were worried about like who caused you the most fear in my case it was absolutely friends family you know very close people um i really don't care how people in public think about me i don't care how my coworkers think of me it's <laughs> for me that is very low on my list of priorities for me it was all about the family and friends and people immediately around me. Um, at the time, my ex-wife was probably the most important person in terms of uh, how she responded. Um, and, you know, obviously my parents, my siblings, and all of my extended family, it was, you know, that was, that was what was most important to me. I didn't want to lose any of them. Yeah. And luckily in my case, I haven't. So which level of connection caused you the most, caused you the most grief, right? Gave you the most push pushback? Oh, I mean, in my case, that was definitely the in-laws. <laughs> <laughs> um, easily. Uh, it, and to some extent, and I think this is a lot, um, this can be a lot more uh, relatable, especially to other trans folks, is uh, my, w or was my ex-wife. Um, because not only... Um, her own attitude or her own feelings on the matter could, you know, affect it, but also the way I felt about her and just knowing the way that my decisions and my actions were going to affect her. Um, you know, even though, uh, e even when she was being supportive, it wouldn't necessarily matter because I, I still knew that, that I was having an impact on her. And so I would still feel that. And yeah, it, it could be, it could be very difficult. And I think that was easily the most emotionally um, difficult aspect of it for me was, was Megan. Um, even though she was supportive. Um, yeah. It, it, it was very difficult to think about. Sure. Um, and here's, here's something interesting. I don't even know exactly how to word this, but when you started making changes and started acting in alignment with who you were, um, and again, you can tell you know the story from your perspective or even just give advice to people in general of how to handle these situations, but when you start making those changes, acting in accordance with who you really are, do you explain a lot of what you're doing and why to the world, or you just kind of do your thing and let them figure it out on their own? That's a very good question. Um, in my case, I've mostly just done my own thing and let other people figure it out. Um, I'm always willing to help uh, you know, answer questions and stuff about myself. That's not necessarily always something that trans people want to have to do, though, because we do have to answer a lot of questions about our own lives and about other people. And sometimes it's just exhausting. Um, but I try and be as open about it as I can when people have questions. Um, honestly, though, I don't really bother explaining myself unless somebody asks. And even then, if they ask in such a way that makes it clear that they don't really care what my answer is, they just don't like me or they don't want to, you know, know any better, they just want to make my life more difficult, then I don't even give a shit. I just say, yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm allowed to swear on your podcast. <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. Um, so... As you, you know, began to act, right, particularly in the early days, but honestly, you can answer this question in the context of your whole journey. Um, did you find that your determination and your resolution fluctuated much? Um, in my case, no. Uh, I didn't ever feel as though there was a turning back point. You know, once I started, it was locked in. You know, the course was set and I was not going to be turning back or turning aside for anything. I'm not sure um, how, how well that, you know, translates for other people though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, from your, your life experiences across your whole life and even from the relationships you've had and people you've known, um, 
I don't know, can you give any advice on if somebody's feeling the resolution wavering, what, what they can do? That is a very good question. Um, what helps the most is to have other people like you who either are going through the same changes or have already gone through. And actually, people who have already gone through those changes is preferable because they've already seen the other side. They know what you're going through and how you can get through it. And they know, you know, what, what's going to work and what's not. And so, yeah, having other, you know, older trans people or at least trans people who had been out longer than myself was wonderful for me. It was so affirming and so um, it, it was just exactly what I needed to, you know, be able to hear other people who had already experienced these things and knew what I was going through and that I wasn't alone and that I'm not, you know, the first person who's ever had to do these things. So, yeah, yeah that was very wonderful for me. Yeah. All right. So now, you know, on the on our closing segment here, right, we're going to take a look back at, you know, your life now that you've made the transition, now that you are finally living the life that you actually were meant to live rather than what people expected of you. Mm -hmm. um, what benefits can you, what benefits have you found from living life in alignment with who you really are? Um, what I can say is that uh, living, living a lie is exhausting. It takes so much out of you to be someone who you're not. And just having my own self and my own, you know, feelings, my own everything, just be me and be real is, uh, it's so relieving. It takes so much stress and pressure off of me that I used to have. Um, I was constantly anxious about what I was and who I was and what I was doing and everything before. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> it's it's definitely something that once you've gotten to that other side it's so hard to think of yourself ever going back or ever living you know a lie again because it's so so much more um it, so much more everything really it's it's more of all the emotions it's more of all of the feelings and experiences that you should have been having all along but when you're living a lie you're almost watching those things happen to somebody else because it is somebody else. It's not who you are. So it doesn't feel like it's happening to you. It feels like it's happening to someone else. And now, now that I'm living my, my life as me, now I get to feel those emotions. I get to experience them instead of feeling like I'm watching someone else go through them. That's awesome. Um, now that you've been through what is an incredibly, incredibly difficult challenge, possibly the most challenging thing you've had to do in your life, um, do you find that other challenges, other ambitions, other scary things seem smaller by comparison? Do you, do you, do you face other challenges differently than you did pre-transition? Oh, definitely. I mean, absolutely. Every other challenge that I now face is just so much more surmountable. It's... Um, it's really made me a lot bolder in every aspect of my life. Um, even though there are now obstacles in my way that I didn't have before, such as being a trans person and being a woman, um, I have so much more, more resolve, more uh, courage and more, you know, uh, just drive to do more and to try more. And I don't have the same kinds of fear that I had of doing new things that I used to. So I think I know your answer already, but I'll go ahead and ask it. You know, uh, there's been a lot of costs. There's been a big price associated with what you've had to do. Um, there have also been a lot of benefits from what you've done. Would you say that in your case, the benefits you've gained from this transition have outweighed the costs? Absolutely. A hundred percent. Many, many times over. Um, it's It's been wonderful. And even all of the the shit and transmisia that I have to put up with and everything that I face that makes life difficult, it still does not even come close to comparing with all the good that has come from it and how much better I feel and how much more rich and fulfilled my life is. So I'm going to make a, a little note here for the audience listening, right? Um, there are some undeniable social downsides, relationship downsides, emotional downsides to 
you know, announcing your gender is changing, right? Being a trans person is not an easy thing to do. So there are some serious downsides to what Dame did. And even then, Dame saying that it is absolutely worth it. And I would say that for, you know, most of us listening, right, the transitions we're making in our life are not nearly as dramatic as changing gender, right? Becoming an entrepreneur, writing a book, you know, becoming a public speaker, all these things that a lot of people are scared to do. There is not nearly the downside associated to those as there is with changing your gender. So if the good outweighs the bad in Dame's case, it definitely would in, in, in you know, other cases. And I'd like to add, um, just on that terminology, that at least, you know, in, in, in my case and in most trans people that I know, um, we don't ever really feel like we changed our gender, just that we stopped lying about what it was and stopped lying about who we were. Um, it's really just discovering who you were all along. Yep. Well, I appreciate you, you, uh, you, you, pull, you pulling out that language. You're right about that. Cool. All right. So one last question for you, Dame. Mm-hmm. If there were, you know, if you were sitting across the table from somebody who really felt trapped living a life that they didn't choose for themselves for whatever reason, mm-hmm. what are three pieces of advice you would give to them in closing? Um, that's very difficult because in every situation, you know, without knowing any person, any individually, I don't know what challenges they face. And, you know, sometimes the challenges that are in your way for coming out as a trans person or a queer person, sometimes it really is a matter of life and death, the dangers that are posed to you. So I can't say for everyone that transition is going to be, you know, the appropriate thing to do. Um, but if it is at all possible for you to, to change your, your life to, you know, be more yourself authentically, and this applies to more than just gender and sexuality, but to other things in life, the closer you can be to your authentic self, the better a life you're going to live. You absolutely deserve that. You deserve to live as yourself, your authentic self and not be lying to everyone about who you are because being forced to lie about who you are yourself, it's so damaging and it's so hurtful. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Again, what you've gone through is, you know, orders of magnitude stronger than what most of the listeners to this have gone through. So I think to be able to, you know, talk about these, uh, talk about these topics with someone like yourself has been hugely beneficial. I know for me, right. Um, You wouldn't think there'd be, you know, a ton of parallel between, um, you know, transitioning your gender that you express to the world and starting a podcast. But I'm telling you, I have felt a lot of the things that you've been saying in my gut from, you know, even just the the small shifts I've had to make to my own identity as I step out of, I'm just a software sales guy and nothing else to, I can be more than that, you know? So uh, I imagine a lot of listeners to this will also have that same experience of identifying with a lot that you said, even though you wouldn't, you know, upfront expect the similarities to be there. Yeah, I'm glad. And I think there is a lot to be learned from, uh, the experience of transitioning for anybody, even regardless of what, you know, your gender or sexuality is. And, you know, it's, it's something that I, I really feel like everybody should get to experience is some sort of level of that life change that, that, you know, inter, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Internal revelation or, or examination of yourself and who you are. Cool. Well, thanks a ton for your time today, Dame.